philosophy. But here's what's really crucial. We read Lenin not only in light of the text that went before, but in light of the text that came after. And that may seem like a mysterious or a secret society or a cult-like way of reading Lenin. But the point is that Lukács and Korsh, it should have been clear from our readings, think that this is precisely their drawing out Lenin's, not just Lenin's theory, but his understanding of his theory, his practice, and the fluctuating relationship between his theory and practice. They think that those central texts and Lenin's revolutionary practice in 1905 and 1917 and afterwards were what they were commenting on, that they were simply theoretically expanding on, reflecting on a relationship between theory and practice that Lenin had already developed earlier. So the point is, and there is no text more important for Korsh and Lukács of Lenin's than this state revolution, because it's the text of August 1917. It's the text after the February Revolution and before the October Revolution. It's the text that is written in the moment, right? It is not what is to be done. Obviously, these other texts are written in moments. But insofar as you want to understand Lenin as the leader, ultimately, of the Bolshevik Revolution, right? And Lenin as the foremost uh, advanced symptom of the way that Marxist radicals, Marxist critics of the Second International understood the relationship between theory and practice and its fluctuation over time, it's Lenin's writing and it's Lenin's practice in 1917 and his text, above all, State and Revolution, that is that source. And since I hope you're convinced by now, and if you're not, I don't know what further, I mean, by the earlier syllabus, Lukács and Korsh imagine they are unpacking State and Revolution just like State and Revolution is a commentary on Marx, Engels, and by way of Marx and Engels, earlier radical bourgeois thinkers. So this, to say this, to say that we read what is to be done, and State and Revolution, and left-wing communism and infantile disorder, by way of their predecessor, but also by way of their successors, in some cases by as much as 10 years, right, is not a cult-like activity, right? It is rather taking seriously the fact that Lukács and Korch understood themselves to be unpacking on, commenting on, theoretically reflecting on further a problem of the relationship in theory and practice that Lenin most symptomatically put forward. Right? They are trying to get at the self-understanding of Lenin as expressed in his texts and his political practice. Okay? And so hopefully by now it should be very clear why the syllabus goes up to the 1870s, goes rigorously chronologically, then skips to the de digestion of Lenin and Luxembourg and Trotsky's revolutionary thought and practice, revolutionary politics in thought and practice, in Korsh and Lukács in 1923. And it appears we should just keep going forward. Why aren't we now launching into the Frankfurt School? Why are we going back, right? I hope you see that this is both absolutely valid, that it is as important to read Constant and Marx in Lenin in State and Revolution. That is vital. But as important as that is reading Lukács and Korsh in State and Revolution, okay? Because it was their self-understanding of their own theoretical reflection, okay? That all being said, I just want to set up your, your <laughs> State and Revolution. No, that's all, I mean, I, this is a way of setting I'm up a discussion. I'm definitely not a good person to do the introduction since I don't know the texts that you've read uh, last semester. And, well, that was one problem. Uh, while presenting, and for me also, it was actually, I mean, I realized that it was actually not really, uh, actually, I don't know which, whether there is, and if there is, which would be like the leading question of the syllabus, or like the leading questions, if there are several. So um, I basically just s try to present what I understood from the text, and it's, it's really, really very basic, and, um, quite short. So, um, well, for me, um, the book is really coherent in the sense that it, is, it discusses the one main question that is also already uh, in the title, so the function of the socialist revolution for the state and vice versa, what, roles, what role does the state play for a socialist revolution? And um, then the text can be split in three parts. Um, I took together the first and the fifth chapter, which presents the nature and the definition of the state and what Lenin then calls its withering away. Although I read the German text, and in German they say the Abstärken des Staates, like it would be more the dying 
of the state. It would be more like a really, it would be a stronger text, I think. So I don't know what's in Russian, but in Norwegian. I, I, I think that he actually, because he's citing the angles, okay. it's the outflow song, but like the like, vibration. Uh, yeah, it's no, it's really like, die in in the work there is to the it's up and there is dying in it so it's really like strong stronger uh, part of this integration of the state but anyway so this like chapter four one and five and then the chapters two to four contain this uh, more uh, uh, historical debate of uh, the revolutionary processes mainly of 1848 and the Paris Commune and then the last chapter, he goes back and criticizes uh, the absence of what he sh uh, defines during the whole text as like the, the main question, the central question for contemporary communism, com com contemporary in his sense, this question of the relation between state and uh, socialist revolution, and the absence of this question within the second international. And, um, so in short, and really similar to what we saw uh, last week in Trotsky's te text, Lenin uses the histo his historical experience uh, to answer parts of the question that he is asking and articulates it uh, together with writings from Marx and Engels that he contrasts to opinions from what he calls the opportunists, the opportunists or the petit bourgeois social democrats. So the two questions, what is the function of social revolution for the state uh, or, the, or the state for the social revolution, of, course, of course, need the definition of what is the state, meaning what is the bourgeois state. Um, <coughs> and here in chapter one, he really gives uh, quite an uh, explicit definition. It is a product and a symptom of irre irre irreducible contradictions between classes. So it is a product of class ant antagonisms. He says uh, the state arises where, when, and insofar as class antagonism objectively cannot be reconci reconciled. Uh, and actually in this sentence already are all the consequences of what will follow uh, uh, mainly the idea of uh, the abolition of the state. <coughs> so the only reason uh, of existence for the state for the state is the presence of this class antagonism, um, which is, uh, as Lenin reminds us by citing Engels, not a natural or inevitable condition, but the sign of a certain development of society. He says the state has not existed from all eternity. It is uh, this particular time uh, of society or time in history where the state arises and where he has his um, objective like necessi necessity to uh, function as the, um, I won't find the word, like the, the one who secures the uh, survival of capitalism. Which also means that the idea, for instance, uh, which is, for instance, promoted by Kautsky, that the state would be an institution for class conciliation is not, uh, uh, is fundamentally wrong. Um, he, Lenin then goes on to describe in more detail the state, what, what the state isn't. He uses, to describe it, he uses the notion that he takes from Marx of the state machine. And so he says that the first characteristic of a state is its organization into a, na a nation state, an idea that I think he doesn't really develop further. The second one is uh, its use of public po power, of course, in form of uh, institutionalized forms of control over the population, such as the police, prisons, etc., etc. Um, what I understood as being <coughs> like this more, like the really official or explicit aspects of what Foucault then would describe th these techniques of power, but without this in embodiment of power structures within the subject. Um, then. The third characteristic is the state uh, of the state, and its power is to the possibility that he has to raise taxes and that he can accumulate debts, meaning to impose its economic system, capitalism, on uh, society. And there is a relate to, related to this economic uh, power is its democratic functioning. Uh, actually, as Lenin argues, there is no other economic, uh, no political organization that serves as well capitalism as does demo democracy. And then he cites also this example of uh, voting, saying that uh, voting for is actually just a way of um, uh, sustaining the capitalist society and capitalist economy. economy. So, uh, presenting all this in the first chapter, it is very clear that 
um, every revolutionary mo movement has to come to terms with the role of the state as the structure organizing society in its totality. And um, for Lenin, the question has therefore to be how to overcome this instrument of power for the ruling class. Um, and if we adopt like, his metaphor of the state of, uh, as a machine, then, um, I mean, Lenin is not a simplest uh, technof technof technophobic, but he has this idea, there is this idea of the machine has eventually to be destroyed, or it, has, it, it, it will eventually break on its own, and it will become a superfluous. But um, this, um, the realization of this, of the destruction of this state machine is not linear, or, or it, it is linear, but it goes, it has several steps, and that's what he explains then further in the text. Um, <clears throat> so the re I will now talk about the revolution, or what he defines as what is the revolution uh, in his uh, text. So the revolution, of course, then is necessary for the overthrowing of the uh, social, economic, and political conditions. <coughs> and he says, still in the chapter, in chapter one, if the state is the product of the irreconciliability of the class antagonisms, it is clear that the liberation of the oppressed class is impossible, not only without a violent revolution, but also without the destruction of the apparatus of state power which was created by the ruling class. So the revolution is necessary to um, uh, to state to arrive at this uh, stateless society, which eventually is the goal that he defines in his text. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so this in the in the fifth chapter, then he describes this um, the, the gradual actually the gradual realization of this socialist society, uh, in, which contains several historical stages that lead from. The capitalist society, a capitalist society, to a socialist society, and one of the stages is this uh, revolution, um, the violent revolution, which would be, uh, which would then lead to the dictatorship of the proletarian, proletariat. Sorry. At at some point, Lenin then underlines that. Uh, the whole theory of Marx, and here I, see, I cite the whole theory of Marx, is the application of the theory of development in its most cons consistent, complete, considered form to modern capitalism. So there is, he says that there is this uh, really, uh, 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 is this a ther theory of uh, evolution? And uh, he says naturally Marx was faced with the problem of applying this theory both to the forthcoming collapse of capitalism and to the future development of future communism. And one question that, of course, I mean, I, I uh, was asking myself, and which is, um, okay, I think, quite a, quite, a, quite a classic critique to Marxism, is what do we do with this conception of history as gradual development, and uh, what do, do we do with this tele teleological implications? So, what we do with the idea of history as a as pursuing necessarily a goal? Um, what we, can we say about the affirmation that capitalism necessarily needs to socialism and that the revolution is a consequence of, of capitalism, which therefore is the reason of the re revolution. So, so in, in Lenin's text, the forthcoming collapse of capitalism is the result of the proletarian revolution re leading to the proletarian dictatorship. And this proletarian di dictatorship would be kind of an interregnum in which the bourgeois state, this machine still works, but um, uh, it works this time to oppress the past ruling class and to ensure the proletariat's power. Uh, there I had another like, question or problem with the text. Um, he says uh, in chapter five, he says democracy for the vast majority of the people uh, uh, and suppression by force means exclusion from democracy of the exploiters and oppressors of the people. This is the change democracy undergoes during the transition from capitalism to communism. And um, I mean, he several times he speaks for, of the also of the revolution of the people, etc. So there is this idea that the revolution and uh, the, the proletarian dictatorship is um, a moment of the like of the majority of the people. It is the majority of the people will be the ruling class. But at the same time, he also speaks of uh, the avant-garde of the proletariat as, of the, of, uh, as an avant-garde who has to lead the other classes. 
So I thought that there was a kind of uh, tension between uh, the class that is supposed to be the majority, that is supposed to be like the 99%, but at the same time is to, to uh, be this um, leader, leader for all the other classes. So, but I'm not sure whether I didn't read it the text, I didn't under, maybe I didn't understand, but from, I thought there was quite, the term avant-garde was, uh, I th was a problem for me, while reading the text, but, so. <laughs> um, but then, um, so, but maybe going back again to, to Trotsky's text of last week when he talks about the three prerequisites for a socialist society also. He has also these three uh, points, what it is or what it needs to have a socialist society and he talked about uh, equal distribution and planned production, the conquest of the power by the working class and the dictatorship of the proletariat. And this is actually, I mean, that that is what I understood what would be this lower uh, stage of uh, Lenin's um, model, like this is the dictatorship of the proletariat um, where we have this economic model of collectivization and we have the ruling uh, by the working class, but then um, Lenin following Marx goes further and says that that's, yeah, that's like this first step or the first stage of communist society and there would be another uh, uh, step because, as as remains Lenin throughout the text, it is um, true freedom or it can also come uh, can only uh, be uh, attained in a true classless society, and it is not possible to have this classless society as long as you have a ruling class. So the goal is to abolish classes and the state. Um, and then that's like where uh, I thought the text gets very. Um, I mean, interesting, but also a little bit opaque because it is. While whereas the the, the text is like until the, the end is organized, uh, or like the historical model that he proposes always is organized about this revolutionary moment. So we have the years with kind of ruptures where things happen uh, within history and things change, and then suddenly after this, um, after the uh, proletarian revolution. Um, with this idea of the state withering away, it's more this kind of biological uh, model, or I don't know exactly, it's like suddenly there are no more ruptures within society, but just everything fades out and is then um, uh, supposed to get uh, transformed in a more or less or, or organic uh, way. Um, I looked at the, the Russian word is Odmirania, which means like literally passing out of the world. Okay, yeah. Near and out of. So, um, yeah, so this, when the state passes out of the world, then we come to this stateless society. And uh, what, I mean, Lenin describes it uh, some, uh, a little bit. It is this classless society, stateless organization. He says uh, that it is um, a society in which the antithesis between mental and physical labor disappears. I don't know what this really means. Um, um, and then uh, there is this, uh, yeah, there is this one thing that I thought really um, uh, interesting that he uh, at several he in repeats and insists. Uh, at several moments during the text that he is not a uh, utop utopist uh, and that Mar Marxists are not, it's not a utopian um, uh, theory but it is a really a scientific theory so he uh, always says for instance um, uh, yeah that, that this idea of the development to, towards, the, towards this new uh, society is, is not a utopian idea or a utopian development, but it is the consequence of the abolishment of capitalism and the and the uh, implementation of socialist um, uh, society. So it's not about imagining a new society which would be completely disconnected from the actual um, uh, from the current state of of society. And then he says at the end of the fifth chapter, it has never entered the head of any socialist to promise that the higher phase of the development of communism will arrive. 
As for the greatest socialists forecast that it will arrive, it pres presupposes not the present ordinary run of people who are capable of damaging the stocks of public wealth just for fun and of demanding the impossible. And this idea um, of it it needs other people to realize uh, this socialist uh, state. Actually, is something that um, also Trot Trotsky mentions in his text. We did text. We didn't talk about that last week, but he also he talks about socialist psychology and that um, he says if socialism aimed uh, aimed at creating a new human nature within the limits of the old society, it would be nothing more than a new edition of the um, of moralistic utopias. Socialism does not aim at creating a socialist psychology uh, as a prerequisite to socialism, but at creating socialist conditions of life as a prerequisite to socialist psychology. So this idea of the new man, like there, there we need a new, new, new human being um, for this new society, which I think uh, contains, even though Lenin like tries to say, tries argues that it's not true but I think it contains this utopian moment where you where it's like disconnected from historical development or it's yeah anyway that was like another point that struck me and um, maybe that's all. I mean I can what I think well, I, I, when I focus on this point it is that for me uh, and Maybe that's also why I'm here. Um, one of the questions that for me are really um, like important today is that I feel that the idea of revolution today seems kind of uh, uh, conceivable, not in the sense of that we will have the revolution uh, the day after tomorrow, uh, and certainly not a socialist revolution, but it seems that there are moments uh, the last years we had some moments where this kind of taste of revolution maybe was present or we can it's like it's also a word that appears again etc so there is something about revolution is there so revolution may is maybe not so far away uh, at least of, on this like it's more a feeling than a reality but still but what really lacks I think and what I see also lacking when going to all the different groups uh, that say they, they are revolutionary groups or that, that try to make left-wing uh, politics. What for me lacks is this, um, this project of what comes after, what would come after the revolu revolution. So what if we claim or if we call for radical changes of our society, uh, what is the project that would be proposed and what is the project to which I could identify? Um, because I mean, yeah, the revolution is important to change the society, but it's not, uh, it's not the end point, obviously. At least, I, or maybe it is, but I don't know. So I was, uh, for me, this was like an impo uh, interesting uh, chapter because Lenin tries to define some, like, or he tries to attack this question, and then at the same time, it seems very difficult one, and it's, yeah. Great. Yeah, Thank you. excellent. Yeah. <laughs> we need to prepare for the necessity of revolution. But we, like you say, there's, we, can, we can change things. Thank you, man. Catherine. I think we'll just launch into, a, launch into a general discussion. I just wanted to say something because you had said at the beginning about that not here for the prior syllabus, which has absolutely no relevance to your presentation. But this question of prefigured of politics mm -hmm. you raised, that is what will be in socialism, et cetera, the question of the character of that, is um, something that is just worth thinking about. It's in no way an answer to the issue yeah. you raised. Some, a kind of conclusion, the, the culmination point of the first semester syllabus is Korsh's Marxism and Philosophy, where he raises the question of how does one think about transformation when the object is transformation as you yourself. That is you and your relation with other people. So it's this very strange thought figure because you yourself are the object of the thing you're. Tra you yourself are the object of the transformation, and as you begin to carry out the transformation, 
the object itself transforms. So it's this kind of mm. always fleeting, well, not always fleeting, but this kind of ever ephemeral mm. process of transformation because you yourself are the object. I mean, this is the difficulty of any kind of perfigurative politics, right? That is, that is the recognition of the necessity for social transformation, but the awareness of the fact that necessarily that humanity itself transforms in the process of attempting to transform itself with all of the unintended consequences and uncertainties and unforeseen new problems and dilemmas that raises, right? But I, I didn't mean that by way of any way as an answer to your question yeah. of this problem for figurative politics, mm -hmm. but it's, I think Korsh has a very nice way of highlighting why it's such a dilemma, not just for Lenin, but for anyone who wants to think about changing society. That is, if, if we're talking about a man-made set of institutions about relationships between people and then people's relationships with their innermost selves, mm -hmm. If that's what we're aiming at as the object of transformation, the minute one attempts to do that, one is suddenly transforming both your relationship with others and your relationship with your innermost self. And um, it's, it's, so it's not like trying to transform, say, nature or the natural, non-human, non-built environment, in other words. Mm -hmm. it, it presents that kind of immense problem. But can I just, I'll say one last thing, Russ. The other, the other thing about this, and, and I want to say this not as a comment, but just to open up to general discussion, is I think, though, the reason why it's important of entering on this question of prefigurative politics that you do, because if it is the case, if we can kind of follow Korsh to some degree and sort of talk about the fact that prefigurative politics is not something that the Marxist tradition makes taboo, but rather that the Marxist tradition makes deeply problematic because it really raises what it is the object that you're changing, right? That so makes it almost impossible to speak of, to draw up abstract schemes of what the future will be like from the basis of the present, right? But nevertheless, Marxism does say, how do we get here? How do we get there from here? That's what Marxism is about. So I don't mean to suggest for a second that your question for figure politics is not an appropriate question, yeah. but there's this kind of dilemma or a paradox in Marxism, which is it claims to be the most rigorously thoughtful politics in terms of both theory and practice about how one gets from here to there, much more than any other alternative. But at the same time, it also claims that the object of transformation itself transforms in the act of transformation, because it's humanity. So it's this weird contradiction. And that really, you know, so it's, it's, it is, in a sense, the problem of historical consciousness, the problem of self-awareness, right? So I'm just trying to even put in, not to answer your question, but even to, to, to put it in relief of the syllabus as a whole. But I thought of a way of just opening up general conversations is, this is a nice way of framing politics. What is politics? That is, what's Lenin's conception of politics? And if it is the fact that one can't have a prefigurative politics, what's the basis of revolutionary socialist politics? I mean, I just thought that might be a way of framing the discussion is going into what, what's politics, right? Because Marxism, remember, way back to thesis on Feuerbach, claims to be not an attempt to understand but to change the world. A claim that it is the most advanced form of the effort to change the world, right? So necessarily, Marxism is a politics, above all else, beyond theory, beyond labor unions, beyond class struggle. It's political practice. That's what it rises and falls on. And something I forgot to say earlier before your thing was simply to say that really the question of Marxism is not, well, we, we should get into this in discussion, but I'll put this out now, that the real question of the validity of Marxism is not the question of Marx and Engels, it's the question of Lenin. We can, uh, we'll get into that in details, but I just wanted to put that out as a provocative statement, that it's not the, the whole purposeness of thinking through Marxism and the real question of its continuing validity or its persistence of the present is not really the question of Marx and Engels' relevance, but rather the question of Lenin's relevance. As that person who was the leader of the practical effort that most radically tried to transform the world, from a basis of a Marxist understanding of theory, practice, and the relationship between them, and its development. So I just wanted to frame the conversation with that. Yeah. What's what, politics in Lenin? What Lenin was speaking of is Marx's economic determinism. That is the basis of his philosophy that economic determinism determines the development of and the change of your psychological mm. outlook and your 
possessiveness of property and all that. It is economic determinism that determines that. As you change the economy into a, co a communist economy, such as Lenin did early in, 19, in, in his war communism, he completely abolished buying and selling of property and had strict distribution in his war communism before 1921, when he developed the uh, printing of money and the paid wages even to the internally to his communist party, which was that was the corrupting element. The money being paid wages to the party within the communist economy, that was the corrupting element of the society. I, I would I would actually say I mean I don't I don't think it's quite as simple as that because I mean the entire premise of what is to be done, for example, is a, is a polemic, a, a long polemic with what he calls the economists, who are strict economic determinists, who believe that, and the point that he has there is, you know, why is there even, why is politics even necessary if everything is strictly economically determined? Why even have a party um, if, if things are just going to happen or change of their own To accord? change the economy, to change the determination of the economy. But I mean, th there's no sense of agency in a purely economically determined. I mean, the economy determines the sort of horizon of possibilities. I would say, like the, the development of the means of production. But in terms of actually yeah, acting to transform, transform these uh, socio-economic structures, um, that's that largely depends on social consciousness and the development of social consciousness. Maybe one way of putting it. Just responding to you, James, like when you said really it's about Lenin, so like Marx and Engels, like that, that kind of formulation. That, and I don't think you disagree with this, but that, you know, Lenin, you know, obviously he's like quoting, like he's like using these, like, like the way in which Marx and Engels become relevant for Lenin, like the way in which 1848 becomes relevant like for Lenin, like that's like Lenin's moment. When you were describing the syllabus earlier, not like as a kind of linear, but as in a knot. Yeah. Like it's sort of there in the Lenin, right? Like he's trying to find what is it that not only 1848, but like 1871, like the, this, these like moments and like what is it that they illuminate on the nature of the state? And so anyway, so the formulation of like it's really about Lenin. Yes, it's about like Lenin, but only insofar as like Lenin's trying to make like Marx and Engels like speak his moment. Um. I'd like to take up. Uh, By the way, you weren't here last week, so this show you yeah, a way. I'd, I'd like to take up a point of, uh, that James is trying to highlight from your presentation that I thought was uh, really salient in terms of our present moment. Uh, and in terms of just, I mean, it's important in our present moment, in like, just as it is important in any potentially, you know, revolutionary, transformative moment. The idea of, you know, whether a sort of, you know, post-capitalist psychology is necessary to create a post-capitalist world, or whether post-capitalist social conditions, a post-capitalist world, is necessary to create this new man, or, new, yeah, new human being. And, I mean, I think that he's he's not succumbing to the kind of like crude based superstructure narrative of just uh, materiality determining ideality, uh, consciousness being determined by existence. I mean, the whole idealist narrative uh, proclaimed by thinkers like Schelling and Hegel was that there was an identity of epistemology and ontology of thought and being and of consciousness and existence, but they assigned priority to the way that we think about the world, determining basically how the world is. Uh, Marx as part of his sort of inversion of Hegel, his standing Hegel on his head, says that, you know, consciousness is more the product of, you know, the material reproduction of society than it is any sort of free-floating, um, just uh, self-determining autonomous entity. Um, and I think that one of the common tropes politically that we see today um, that, I mean, came up over the course of the 20th century and, you know, even before then, was this idea that we need to change the way that we behave, the way that we think about things, and that will 
somehow, you know, cumulatively lead to a sort of transformation of the world. Um, you get this a lot. I mean, people talk about lifestyle politics or prefigurative politics. Gandhi's uh, injunction to uh, be the change you want to see in the world. Um, I think that. I think that the recognition uh, that uh, Marx had in the Eleventh Thesis on Feuerbach that you know the point is to change the world, but the world is, not, as James said, is not just nature, something apart from us. The world is us, um, so it's really changing ourselves. But I mean that the way to conceive of that is not as just a sort of like to change the way that we think about things in, as individuals, but rather to change society as a whole insofar as society itself determines our individuality. That's, that's, that's why I would say he's actually not utopian uh, when he talks about the creation of a new man, because mm -hmm. I would say that society has already created new forms of subjectivity that didn't necessarily exist in past ages. And humanity, I mean, what people say, call human nature, I mean, sure that it's a sort of like baseline physiological uh, regularity to human existence, but over over time, I would say what people call, commonly refer to as human nature is wildly malleable and and very elastic and subject to transformation as as history and society, you know, go through these various you know evolutions, revolutions, and uh, radical changes. Yeah, I try to talk. Uh, about the changed world that Marx said at the 11th. I think what Marx means is that the changed capitalist system, relations of production, very concrete economic system of capitalism, after this basement changed, human being himself can change too, change along with the um, procession when you change the world. But the problem for Marx is that what what kind of things that about our human being could be changed after the world has been changed? That is very complicated. My way is to deal with this problem by separate what's the concept of human being. When Marx talked the change, basically it's ideology, idea, thinking, religion, philosophy, but not nature human being. So in this sense, Marx and Engels discuss the problem differently. I think I have an article in that book. I have written several articles to analyze the problem. So it's the, the concept is very concrete. And this is the first thing. The second, I try to answer your question about the tension. Uh, proletary dictatorship and the 99%. Proletary dictatorship, working class as a leading class, they are now 99%. Mm -hmm. Who they will need? Who they could be need? Only 1%. It's not this sense. Uh, I think you didn't uh, make a clear about what what Nia Ling said about wor working class at that time. I guess, I suppose, is five percent or ten percent working class. When he talk, talk about, <coughs> yeah, there should be could be eight percent parents. So by Nia Ling's sense, the leading class is only working class, not parents. Parents are needed by workers. Mm -hmm. So proletariat dictatorship also means working dictatorship. So that's only maybe you know. Society is still mediated by the exchange of labor. Five percent of working class. Mm -hmm. Not include parents. My parents is regarded as uh, small or little bourgeoisie. Yeah, but it, it does bring up a, a like what I think you're getting at is contradiction about whether or not. I mean, because Lenin, he's going. I mean, he sort of like he 
uses, you know, it's like a democracy of the majority, and this is like a democracy of the majority in like, a, in like, a, in a pretty like, like almost like Plato like would describe it, um, except he would have it leading to tyranny, but um, but there's a contradiction in, in Lenin's claiming that this that this workers government is going to set up a a democracy of the majority, and then the actuality of it, you know, being a theoretical uh, d democracy of the majority, like a, a, a like a policy like wise democracy of the majority, I like a trying to create. Democracy of majority is after revolution. Yeah, well, it, it tries to create. I mean, it's in the interest of the democracy, in the interest of the majority. Class difference. Yeah. Then there's um, democracy for majority, because the yeah. class difference is already abolished. Yeah, but there's a, but there's yeah. a question of. As not before. Mm -hmm. But there's a question of, uh, and I think that this is where like he argue, wait, wait, where he comes into conflict with the, with the um, reformists is, is that you don't have to, or that it's almost impossible to have. A majority, a real majority, because of the just of the way that bourgeois society, um, could, like just social relations, like like he he stat, like the he states that figure of like the the most um, workers that were ever um, like the biggest like party they ever had in Germany was like what, like one million, one point five million or something. I don't know, but nowhere close to a majority. So like yeah. there, there is no, there's this conflict of like majority, the interest of the majority and the actual majority. Yeah. I, I think Can I say something? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, just because it reminded me of a comment that you made last week, Rob, about like when we were talking about, we were talking about the relationship of like objective conditions and like historical consciousness as like a subjective condition and how these like moments of consciousness actually become part of an objective condition in forms of like institutions such as the state. And that like at least for Lenin it seems to me that in the specifically in the post eighteen forty eight world, the state comes to embody for him kind of institutionalized class war. Right? That he talks mm -hmm. about how really the withering away of the state would happen because after I mean I'm being crude, but like after the expropriation mm -hmm. of people who are capitalist, there isn't a need for a state, and what mm -hmm. he means by that is that the role then therefore of the state is a subjugation of one class to another. Mm -hmm. And so, and it seems to me therefore that what we're talking about is that the state then is like fundamentally represents a problem in like the, in democracy of the 19th century, like a crisis in like very principle of, of democracy and its execution. And so that conception of democracy, I think, <clears throat> is a bit different than sort of saying, you know, what what do most people want? Um, I think that maybe we should talk about that because again, like if there is this reinscription of like the crisis of 1848 and that Lenin is seeing the state as like a sort of consolidation of a particular type of crisis in democracy, then the withering away of the state or the smashing of the state in trying to do, trying to make inroads towards the problem is more than simply sort of, you know, the will of the majority. I, I think that's cr absolutely crucial, Pam. Just be, just and as it's a way to connect it to Rob's comment, is Lenin's deployment at the beginning of Engels from state origins of family, state private property, this kind of stuff, right? It, there's a great deal taken for granted because at one register he's talking about the state as it's existed since he's talking about that classes have come into contradiction with one another. But then he moves in this language of the so-called modern representative state, right, where he talks about the democratic republic being the perfect political shell with universal suffrage. And contained in that whole movement, right, is this entire shift in the character of things, right, contained in the movement from the rise of the state with the Neolithic revolution, the birth of the civilization, to the modern representative state of bourgeois society, full-fledged bourgeois society in the 19th century, this massive taken for granted kind of shift takes place there. And I only say that because these categories like democracy and all of the questions he's raising, like the rule of the majority, the, the actual possibility of working class democracy, right? 
it can appear to have these kind of time, like the questions of, it can appear to have a kind of, time, you know, like the way political scientists deal with this. Like you take Aristotle and you sort of say, there can be democracy rule of the many, and there can be oligarchy rule of the few, and monarchy rule of the single, right? But what's, what, what, just to highlight what Pam's saying is the kind of, the character of what he's dealing with in democracy has sort of radically transformed historically, if that, if that you know, sort of makes sense, such that if you think about it in terms of the, the syllabus as a whole, and I'm, I really, I'm sorry to bring this up because it's just, it's again, it's the kind of unsaid beginning of state revolution. Going way back to Kant and Constant, everyone remembers that, and I just, just two minute riff on the emergence of bourgeois society, right? Bourgeois society really, for the first time, constitutes an independent domain like the political, just as it, for the first time, constitutes an independent domain of the economic, the aesthetic, the cultural, etc. Right? Now, there's a bad way of speaking about this, which is to say, in pre-modernity, before bourgeois society, these things were all entangled. And then they become untangled once bourgeois society rises up. You have politics in the state, you have economy, separate, all of these things. But the truth is, they weren't entangled. They didn't exist. Right? Everything was interpreted within a cosmological worldview of the divine origins of humanity, connecting th things to people long dead and people yet to be born in a great chain of being. And, and, and usury and trade and barter and every aspect of existence functioned within that cosmology. So with bourgeois society, we saw last time, we have the rise of these independent domains of existence, like the political. There isn't the political prior to bourgeois society. And what's really important in saying there's not the political is bourgeois society, although Engels is right that in some sense the state rises up with the Neolithic Revolution, we should remember all the way back to the Constant and Kant readings that there's a specific character the state takes that makes it radically modern in the 18th and 19th century, which is to say for the first time in between 1600 and 1848, you have the, the emergence of these separate categories of state and civil society. And what's important about that is it's understood that the state is the realm of coercion, legitimate coercion, that simply provides the public infrastructure, the free and equal access to all, to pursue their own private interests in the voluntary, freely interactive world of civil society. That out in civil society, individuals freely act, pursue their own interests, for, form voluntary associations, and that the state simply provides the public framework, the public coercive framework for that. So civil society is the site of voluntarism, the state is the site of coercion, but this is altogether the site of freedom, the site in which the precondition for the freedom of each, sorry, the precondition for the freedom of all is the freedom of each, right? That is to say, remember back to Constant's vision, everyone will be, civil society is the locus of dynamism. Everyone is pursuing their own interests, volunteering, interacting with other, the universal exchange of their labor, entering freely into contracts, not through wars. He says, war is the way of the pre-modern world, trade is the way of the modern world, right? Freely doing this. And the state will just uh, uh, provide the public infrastructure and will change as civil society changes. The nice way he puts it is, you know, air, you get a, the individuals as if a breath of air in civil society and the state just responds to this, right? And just to tie this in further, remember Kant's point, right, from what is enlightenment way back, right? As long as people can criticize, right, then they live in a free state. And what he means by that.